Hello, listeners. Yamina here. Welcome to the Dr. GPCR podcast. Before we dive into this episode, we would like to take a moment to thank our ecosystem partners for their support, namely Domain Therapeutics, GPCR Therapeutics, Design Pharmaceuticals, Montana Molecular, and Orion Biotechnology. Please mark your calendars for our next Dr. GPCR symposium held on Friday, September 22nd on the topic of GPCRs as therapeutic targets. The symposium is free, but you must be a Dr. GPCR ecosystem member, which is also free. Please see the menu button for the symposia page at the top of our welcome page to check out the program and register as a presenter. You don't have to register as an attendee. You just have to be part of the Dr. GPCR ecosystem to get access to the links to join us. We also have set aside two hours for networking and poster presentation on Kumo space that day. The posters don't have to be fully formatted. Just come with a few slides and have a chat with your community members about your favorite GPCR or other signaling proteins that you're working on. If you'd like to present during your, your work during the networking time on September 22nd, please complete the submission form available on our website. There is no limit on the number of posters we can ac accommodate. To present, you'll only need to provide us with the title of your presentation, a one minute video abstract, and come with a few slides to help you discuss your work with your colleagues. Everyone is welcome. If you have any questions or comments, or if you'd like to present your work but don't know how to join us, please feel free to email us at hello at drgpcr.com. What are you doing between November 2nd and 4th? Join me and the Dr. GPCR team at the 22nd edition of the Great Lakes GPCR Retreat at Chateau Montebello in Quebec. We at Dr. GPCR are proud to be supporting this iconic meeting. I've had a blast help organizing this meeting this year with, our, with my colleagues from the University of Ottawa, University of Montreal, and the University of Sherbrooke. Visit gpcrretreat.org for more details on the program. The early bird registration and poster submission deadline is September 8th, and the late registration deadline is September 21st. Hurry up and join us on between November 2nd and 4th. And now let's dive into this episode. Hello, everyone. This is Yamina from Dr. GPCR. And this morning, I'm very happy to have with me Dr. Evi Kustinis. Evi and I met recently at the Gordon Conference in person for the first time, although we've interacted previously. So I'm very, very excited to have you on. Good morning, Evi. Or good afternoon. <laughs> good noon, Yamina. It's very nice to see you and meet you here again. And I'm looking forward to our conversation. And thank you Back so much. Thank you, by the way. Thank you. And thank you for accommodating. I know we've both of us have been busy. So I think we've been postponing this call for, for months now, but uh, we're finally here doing it. Very exciting. All right, let's start at the beginning. Would you please introduce yourself and tell us what is it that you do? Okay, my name is Ivi Kostinis. Um, I'm, I'm a pharmacist by training and um, couldn't imagine I would ever become interested in GPCRs. So pharmacy studies, um, PhD in pharmacology, postdoc, everything GPCR related. And I had many, many different steps in my career. Finally, I mean, I was also at industry, big farmer, small farmer for many, many years and finally ended up at the university. But all my life I've been working um, with GPCR. So now I'm, of course, a professor at university teaching and I have a lab and, um, and an institute here where we, where our group is taking very much care of understanding how GPCRs function. Thank you. That's very interesting. You mentioned, I didn't know that you were in industry as well uh, and large pharma and then getting back to university. I'm very interested in hearing a little bit more about your your story, because typically what people think about is you start in academia. So you do a you know, bachelor's, master's, PhD, postdoc. And then if you go to industry, coming back to academia is a very difficult step. And That's it turns true. out. Yeah, and I'm really interested in hearing a little bit more about uh, about your career. Okay, you... well, yeah, my career is extremely weird, and I think more rare. So, studying pharmacy means that you are um, that you have in mind going to a public pharmacy to work there or in a hospital. And I did all these studies, and I ended up in a pharmacy, both in a hospital and in a public pharmacy, and I was bored to death. 
So I resisted there for two years, but in parallel, I was working for newspapers when new medicines were introduced into the market and there were press releases, press conferences. So I did something to not be that bored. After two years, I couldn't stand it anymore. I insulted the uh, the wife of the owner of the pharmacy, so I had to leave it. So that <laughs> means I had to do something else. I would have left anyway. And then I, I, I remembered I really liked pharmacology. And many GPCRs are part of pharmacology because so many medicines act through GPCR. So I, I was trying to find a place to do my PhD. After that two years of work in the pharmacy, I found it at the University of Bonn and I really enjoyed it. And then, I mean, and there, yeah, you know, uh, it, it was allosteric modulation of G-protein carbon receptors. And then I wanted to learn more and more molecular stuff. And I did a postdoc at the National Institutes of Health um, in Bethesda, USA, three and a half years um, in Jürgen West Group, which was um, same receptor family, but completely new aspects. And then I wanted to go back to uh, university, but I couldn't because I followed my husband to Frankfurt back in Germany. But their university was so terrible that I chose to go to industry. And I ended up in the cardiovascular disease group initially as a postdoc and a few months later as a lab head being allowed to work with G-protein coupled, uh, coupled receptors in the cardiovascular area. And there I, after two years, they wanted to push me into a management position, which I didn't want. And they told me, oh, you will get a car and more money. I said, I don't want a car. I want to do science and I won't be able to do science. And then they were forcing me to take on that management position, but I didn't want. And um, so I chose to leave the company and, and go to a small biotech company in Copenhagen, Denmark, called 70M Pharma. Guess what they are doing? 70M receptors, right? And um, But that was, so four, four, three, four, four years big pharma, then three years small pharma. And all this time I was trying to keep connections to people in um, academia, trying to publish to stay alive so that eventually I could go back because going back was really, really difficult. And then there was, I think, a lot of lucky coincidences that um, made me apply in Bonn University and even get the job there because I was not number one of the list. I was number two, but number one had another offer. So number two is number one, and I took it because I thought it's 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 maybe my the only chance in my life to escape from from pharma and try to see what you can do in um, in academia. And there I am uh, since 2006. Ever since I haven't changed because I think of all the things I have seen, um, academia is still the most enjoyable. And yeah, so this is how it happened. And I know that often you say, oh, once you leave academic research, you will never go back, which is true if you don't publish and you have no connections. But if you manage to have something on your CV, some kind of publications, you may manage to go back. That is fantastic. And I, the reason why I, I was pushing you to, to tell us a little bit more about the stories, because most of our audience is, is in the younger generation, the up and coming early career scientists, or currently either finishing up a postdoc or just started, you know, their job at a university or even their job at a, at a company. And I think that's very important. You made a couple of very interesting points. One is the fact that you need to continue publishing if you can. I think biotech and pharma are very, have changed in the past decade and they're pushing to publish because it looks good for the companies as well. The other thing is uh, keep your contacts. And that's that's all about networking staying in the pool where you know people who can give you advice who can who can help direct you who can put in a good word for you i think that's very important and independently of your level you need to be doing that at least in my opinion yeah i agree i mean i never had people helping me to find contacts but as you move along in your career you see how important it is to have friends and contacts and they will help you at some point to move on yeah. if extremely important. And now when I have my own students, I tell them, go to meetings, meet new people, meet your future collaborators. And if you see them, you will also behave better and more fair when you know the people you are dealing with. So create your network and be fair yeah. to have as many connections as possible that you will need in science to survive. Absolutely. And I think it goes both ways as well. So one is you never know who will be able to help you. But also you have to think about how can you help someone else? Yeah. You know, I think that's very important. It goes both ways. It's it's not an unidirectional 
type of relationship, you get to help people. If you can put in a good word, if you can give them some advice about their project or about the direction or just, you know, let's say you read a paper and you see a post or presentation and you ask the person, did you read this paper? This is a really good paper that could be relevant to your science. That can be helpful. And that's yeah. the that's also a level of, you know, helping out and networking because the yeah. person will remember you. Oh, yeah. that's that's the, you know, that's yeah. the I, one who gave you that paper. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. But this is also what I teach the students to be as helpful as possible, because if you are helpful and you discover others are just parasiting on you and never giving anything back, you will not help them anymore. But I would say in the first place, you would always try to be as helpful as you can, hoping that the other person appreciates this and you know, functions the same way yeah. because you don't want to be abused and you don't want to be the idiot. But I would always help and support people and then hoping of finding a network of people that you can rely on at that and that will help you when you need help. And if people approach us, can you support us? That yes, we can. And, you know, and so it's like you try to construct some kind of win-win situations. So yes. not, okay, I, I'm going to abuse you as much as I can because now, you know, it's and it, yeah. this is the opposite of what I think you should do. You always have to search for interactions that that keep on existing because of the win-win for everybody. Absolutely. That's, no, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that that's what I meant by go, going both ways. And obviously it has to be balanced out. Yes. Um. And and yes, obviously, always asking or always giving and not getting anything back. That's not a. I think it's. I always tell this to people. It's you know having building a relationship. No, what no matter what type of relationship, it's like dating. You have to like each other, and everybody has to weigh in and put in, you know, something into that relationship to keep it going. Whether you're looking for a job or for your next mentor. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. So you mentioned starting out in pharmacy. You're not one. You're not the first guest on the podcast who has a degree in pharmacy, who worked in a pharmacy and did not like it. Um, you mentioned that you always liked molecular pharmacology. Do you remember the first time you heard about GPCRs? I think during my thesis when, oh no, wrong in my studies, of course. I mean, if you know if, what you read since 50 years or almost, um, or that many years that GPCRs are the uh, or the 30 percent, well, it was 50 percent of drugs on the market, actual GPCRs. I think it would be terrible if I said now that during my PhD time, I heard for the first time about <laughs> GPCRs. So that means I must have heard about it before, but I just don't remember this actively. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's okay. It, it happens. I, I had, um, the reason I was asking is because I do remember the first time and we had sometimes guests who said, I knew nothing about GPCRs. I just wanted to work in this lab because I thought it was a very interesting topic or I liked the city or I liked the PI and then they ended up working on GPCRs. We all have a different, um, different story. You know, in my case, it was different. I was, um, when I was working in a pharmacy, I was going to the yearly meetings where we where different professors were give, giving talks and the professor I was fascinated um, um, by because his talk was so good was the professor who then started his career at the university at Bonn just when I applied so I was his first PhD student and I didn't think of the research I was fascinated by the teaching because his class and it was about liver cirrhosis which probably doesn't have much to do with GPCRs and it's a topic that sounds perhaps boring but he made this so fascinating that I yeah. you know I had to approach him after the talk I said okay can I do my thesis in your lab not you know I just wanted to leave pharmacy and I wanted to do something else this was a pharmacologist so I approached him and then he was his subject was allosteric modulation of muscarinic acetylcholine receptors which has nothing to do with matter what it is I think you just have to have some kind of interest in science and then many things can be offered to you and if you are like curious you you may like all of them no yeah. absolutely I agree I agree and it's such an interesting point that you made about you know watching somebody teach and really liking the way they teach I think and in my case for a very long time uh, when I used to go to conferences or to take courses I always felt like I didn't under sometimes I didn't understand what the teaching or the or the talk was about, and then I realized it's not me; it's the way it is presented. Exactly. And some have this 
beautiful way of engaging the crowd and presenting. And no matter what the topic is, you're just fascinated. You can't take your eyes off of that or those slides because the person is so engaging. Exactly. And that was the case. Uh, when I finally, when he accepted me as a PhD student, I was sitting in his lectures for the students, although I didn't have to, because I was just fascinated by the way he was presenting and explaining pharmacology. And there you sit and say, okay, this is my example. I mean, I can never reach this example, but if you are sitting there fascinated by the way he transmits his information and his uh, his lectures were at, in the morning at eight o'clock. You would expect no student to be awake at that time. The classes, you know, the lecture hall was full because of this. Okay? So, and when I studied pharmacy myself, I mean, nobody was sitting there. There were three people and eventually no one anymore. The professor was alone because the classes were terrible. I mean, just dreadful. And mm -hmm. yeah, so it's about how people present things. And now I'm telling my students, oh, go to a good lab, you know, think about what you like and think about whether you like the research, you're excited by it, and then go and choose because going to the right lab may, may be pivotal for your career. Yeah. At my time, we were thinking different. We were also not so focused on good labs. And I mean, I was absolutely not focused on a good lab. I was just fascinated by someone who was teaching so well that you know you want to learn how to do that yeah yeah and I think I think that also shows the passion that the person has for the topic and for teaching and for helping which most of the time translates into how that person is in the lab as well and I think to to be able to give an amazing talk a very good talk where you're engaging takes so much work because you have to practice, practice, practice to get to the point every time and keep the the uh, the audience engaged. So that's also so also shows talent, but passion as well for that. So tell us a little bit more about your your PhD thesis. So you mentioned allosteric modulators. When you started your PhD, uh, did you pick the project you wanted to work on, or did you develop it with with your PI? You're asking me about something that is 31 years ago, <laughs> you know, that means you know now how old I am. Um, I'm taking you down memory lane. <laughs> okay, but um, yes, I had a choice because I came and there were three projects to choose from. And one project was, now let me remember, structure activity relationships of allosteric modulators acting at muscarinic receptors. There, a chemist professor was synthesizing the molecules. The second thing was to, to exclusively analyze alkuronium type allosteric modulators on isolated atria. And the third thing was to study allosteric modulation depending on the ion composition in the buffer. Wow. And, exactly. Wow. And that's okay. So not knowing anything, I mean, I had no shitty idea about what all this was, but I thought, well, structure, structure activity relationships of allosteric modulators acting at muscarinic receptors is perhaps the best option. So I picked this. And it was because after three months, I already had my first poster on a meeting where I could show results, whereas the others have been struggling quite a bit until they could first show their results. So I was lucky. I didn't, you know, didn't really know what I was choosing. Mm -hmm. I thought I chose the worst, the, 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 the best of the worst options. But in, in the end, it was fine. Yeah, that's great. And then at the end of your PhD, you mentioned moving to, to NIH and working in Jürgen West's lab. How did you make that decision? It seems like throughout the conversation that you were very keen on pharmacology and, and, and working in, in a lab and working in science and in academia. What made you decide to move abroad? Um, I loved what I was doing, but what I was doing was extre extremely limited. So the yeah. methods we had access to and the money in the lab was not much. And the methods we had access to was just binding, binding, binding essays. So we did a lot of binding. Um, membranes from hearts that that of of, of cows and pigs and um, so no cells it was all um, animal hearts that we needed and to convert into membranes and do binding studies associations dissociations equilibrium binding studies so pharmacology up and down the classical pharmacology and we had to kill some guinea pigs and um, open the, the the thorax or however you call it you know whatever this. Yeah. 
Yeah. And then to, to excise the heart, prepare the atria, mount them in an organ bath, and then keep them, um, uh, watch them contracting in the presence or absence of the modulators that you are acting. So we had these two methods for three years. I know I have N equal to 66, meaning I killed 66 guinea pigs. I still <laughs> remember that because oh it, was, it was hard to do this as you had to kill them all the time. And then even I had to kill them for the other students who didn't want and who, or who couldn't do this. So, but I don't remember the N number of my binding studies from animals, which I haven't killed because we got the hearts from the, the, the slaughterhouse. But the, the method spectrum was extremely limited. And I and I, I so I loved muscarinic receptors and I was reading, but the methods were so it was so few that I thought, okay, I would like to stay in this receptor family, but learn new methods. And at that time, molecular well, like, yeah, bio biology came up, chimeric receptors, signaling, and and yeah. Jürgen West was the one that was really a pioneer in setting all this up for muscarinic receptors at the National Institutes of Health. So I was applying there. And um, and he was interested in me, so I could go there and and continue as a postdoc, but sticking with the receptor family, just expanding the methods, yeah. which is actually something I also tell people if they would like to de to develop, like broaden your method repertoire, learn more, to ask you know ask new questions and have like a big spectrum. So it was just to increase the spectrum. And my supervisor was really worried because I said, I want to go to this lab and I'm not going anywhere else. And then he said, um, Mrs. Costinis, you don't have to be so obsessed with this one lab. There are more labs in the world you may go to. I said, no, I have to go to this lab. I have to go to Jürgen West. So I go there or I go nowhere. So he was worried that I was obsessed going there. Mm -hmm. And I applied for a fellowship. I didn't get it. I applied again, I got it, and I could go there. Mm -hmm. And then I was there for two years, and then finally Jürgen offered me a, a position to stay there a bit longer, yeah. as I have been less uh, useless, as he probably thought. Anyway, this is how it how it happened then, yeah. And how was the change from, you know, moving from Europe to the U.S.? Uh, did you did you find it? I, I'm trying to. So the 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 place I'm get trying to get to is again knowing the audience who's going to be listening to this, I like to capture how people adapt to change. We all agree that it's important to go abroad or to change your environment as much as possible when you go for a postdoc, because it's important for you as a person to grow, but also as a scientist to show that, you know, plopping you out of your regular environment as a PhD, going into a new one, you can still succeed and you can continue collaborating. That's why I ask these questions. I'm really curious to see what did you think about moving to the US from a cultural perspective, from ad adapting to a new environment? I didn't think so much about culture, about culture, because culture was very different. I was more thinking about the science because at the time I went, it was like, by definition, you had to go to the U.S. to be able to find a job later back in your country. It was just a must. I think now research in Europe has gotten much, much better. So you you don't have to go to the U.S. There are other good labs in this world. It doesn't have to be the States. But at the time I was there, it just looked good in your CV. And coincidentally, it was the lab where I really wanted to go. So yes, you go. You give up a lot of things in Europe, all your friends, your family, because you are gone. But I think it also helps you and, and strengthens or shapes your personality because you are in a completely different place. Everybody's gone, everything's new, and you have to survive there. And suddenly you have colleagues in the lab from all kinds of different nations with nice or weird behavior. Well, it makes you stronger, it helps you survive. So it, the lab environment was very different, much more harsh and much more elbows, you know, I'm a postdoc and I want to be better than you. Before mm -hmm. we were like more working together and suddenly we have competition and even sabotage. So, you know, so it's yeah. just um, the world. And um, yeah, but it, it was a really important move because it was a, it had to be a part of your career. And the culture is something, you know, on the side, which is very different. I enjoyed being there. But I couldn't imagine to be in the U.S. forever because I think that I'm too German or too European to be more at home in Europe yeah. because of cultural reasons. 
yeah. which which doesn't mean that I, I I found the time fantastic and I would like to go again to the national parks and this yeah. is I mean you know it's such a big country everything is so big maybe everything is too big for me you know and I feel <laughs> cozy at at home where things are smaller but um, no the culture is not really mine but I and you know if you're from, from Europe you don't meet so many Americans you meet people from everywhere and not Americans which I think was great for opening your horizon. But um, yeah, so the contact to the real Americans, we didn't have it. But you see, of course, how people live there. But I I, I wouldn't go to the States because I want to live there. I Mm. went there because working quality was excellent and I needed it. Yeah. yeah, and it's interesting you're mentioning, you know, um, how people are different and every everything is big. That is true. Everything is big here in the U.S. and what I and the, including the country. And what I do really like is that depending on which area in the U.S. you go to, it's like you go to a different country, because people are different even within the U.S. Um, you know, and oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, if you're at the west or the east coast or the center, it's so different. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and it's and and it's important, you know. You're mentioning that you preferred going back to Europe because that's what resonated with you. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because it's important to do things that resonate with you. And this is more for the audience around figuring out what is it that you want, what do you like, what do you need for your career, and then being remaining true to yourself, basically. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in a in a way, you make a sacrifice because you give up all your friends and everything, mm-hmm. and there you are in the real. Yeah. Maybe now you would be contacting your friends through Zoom, but I'm not such a big fan of these virtual relationships. I have I prefer real people to yeah. talk. To, you yeah. know, yeah. we couldn't do this digital contacting and socializing at yeah. the time. So you were really alone. And I mean, when I was there for eight months, having worked every Saturday and every Sunday, you know, maybe 80 to 100 hours a week, I got so homesick and I said, okay, I have to go home right now. I just have to leave this country. And then I went home and after two weeks, I recovered. I thought I went back, right? Um, But it was, um, yeah, so it's, you know, so you're struggling. And it's not that, I mean, yeah, you go there and everything's fine and, no, you're suffering, you're struggling, everything is new. And then, yeah, I, I got homesick once and I'm just telling this so open because maybe it happens to others and it's not to feel bad about it. If you feel homesick, go home. Thanks God I had a boss who allowed me because there were other bosses that were telling the Europeans, you can maximally be out of the lab for one week. You have to come back. I mean, if you go to Europe, you travel one day back and forth, you know, it makes no sense. But my boss was different and he understood it and he let me go away. It was fine. And I never had a second attack of being homesick again. It yeah. was then fine. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it's important as well to, to goes back to picking the right lab where you can have this really good relationship with your boss who allows you to do these things. And you're right. Traveling from the U.S. to Europe for when you have just, you know, five to seven days, it's just not worth it because you're most of the time flying and you are barely home for a little bit and then you have to come back. So under two weeks, absolutely not worth it uh, in that sense. All right. We talked about this a little bit uh, before hitting record about your favorite GPCR. I'm still going to ask the question because I'm curious. You mentioned that you don't have a favorite one and maybe I'm I'm, I'm giving out the answer, but um, do you have, which if you had to pick a family or a receptor or anything related to the field, as, as a pharmacologist yourself, what would that protein be? A G protein. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, I, I saw the questions and I, I read the question, what is your favorite GPCR? And the honest answer is, I have no favorite GPCR. I like all of them. And what fascinates me about them is that they activate G proteins, so the way they signal. So for, and if I'm, if, if I try to think about it, I wouldn't be able to identify the GPCR for me. It's just a means to turn on something that happens in the cell because what I really like is what happens after activation. So any receptor could be a means, maybe not adhesion receptors, which are, well, you know, nobody really knows how they function and they wouldn't be the prime example of turning on a signal because we still have to understand how they work. So I find that family fascinating, but it doesn't help me to switch on signaling because what I really like is the signal construction downstream of them. 
That is what I like. And there, I think I'm a big fan of G proteins as they do the signal. And of course, I mean, of, of signaling mechanisms um, in general. Yeah. yeah. Any favorite G protein? My favorite G protein? Yes. <laughs> if you have one. Or maybe I'm biased because we have an inhibitor that helped us study that G protein family a lot. And that is um and that is um the molecule FR inhibiting GQN eleven proteins. So if I had to choose the G protein family, I think I would choose GQ, but I like all of them. Also mm -hmm. the ones that are more challenging, like G twelve thirteen, where we know yes. less about it. So I love all of them. And yeah, favorite is GQ. GQ. Yeah, I think I think um uh, Silvio, uh, Silvio also had a G protein as a favorite, but he also told me that it's difficult because he said, "How do you pick your favorite? It's like have it's like picking a favorite child, <laughs> which yeah. is not not an easy task." That's true. Although every parent has a favorite child, they just don't say it. <laughs> Maybe I I don't know. It's a it's a tough question. I have two, so uh, if I had to pick, it would be a very difficult difficult um you know choice. So. You you finished your your postdoc uh, at NIH, then you came back, worked in industry a little bit, and then you ended up working at the University of Bonn, was starting your lab. How was it to come back from industry to academia, and um, how did you build the the scientific projects uh, in your lab when you started out? That was really difficult, and even when I talked. To the dean before coming he said i don't see how you will ever manage you have not been in academia all your life you have been in a, a, in in um in industry for seven years you're not bringing any project you are bringing nothing you have to start from scratch you have to build your lab from scratch you have no co-worker who can assist you in getting everything started because yeah, so usually people grow with you somehow and then they help you to, to, to build the business. And I said, I have no idea how you will manage, but well, um, yeah. let, let's see. So I thought I will manage. I didn't think about all the difficulties, but I was facing them when I was here because I had no grant money. I had a miserable budget that could just pay the toilet paper and the electricity per year, but nothing else and maybe one FedEx shipment. So it's like, you no, know, it, it's really tough. And I came into labs, I think, which have had a very, very low um, low level equipment. Many things had to be thrown out. And then it took like almost three years until all these uh, renovations um, or renewals had taken place until we finally could work there. The first PhD students, I had to put them in the labs of other people to see what kind of project I could possibly invent to make them work in another person's lab. I think it was really, really, really difficult. But in the end, you manage and it just takes longer until your first paper is there. And, you know, it's just as you have to start from scratch, truly, it just takes longer. And luckily, I had the, the first PhD student is also someone who started studying 10 years later, who was a chimney sweep before and a truck driver, oh. and then studied. And he was he was supporting my research so well. And we got um we, we got a lot into label free analysis of signal transduction and that was a big part of the initial aspects of my work and there this guy ended up of course it took him five years to finish his thesis but he had a paper in nature biotechnology and 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 and, and i think eight nine ten papers in the end it took long until the first one was there but then things began to move but the period in the beginning i think was very very tough Wow, and, still fascinating. Chimney sweeper and truck driver turned PhD, a very successful PhD with a lot of publication. See, I, I, this is why I like the podcast, because you get to learn things that you cannot appreciate by just reading a paper. Um, and it just, we're human. Yes, I mean, and that paper, you know, I mean, the, the first paper, at the my, the my own first paper, my own last author paper at the University of, of Bonn was in JBC, and we were so happy. Or was it in Nature Biotech? I don't even remember. Or so the first 
or the second one was JVC and Nature Biotechnology. And it was just incredible. We couldn't believe it. And this truck driver, chimney sweep PhD student that I had, he was putting such an effort. He fell asleep here in the library because he was working so much for the revision because we couldn't believe it that we had a paper in such a journal in revision. And we were both working day and night, you know? That's and it, it was amazing the effort he did for it. And yeah, but in the end, everything was fine and, and, and the effort was worth it. Absolutely. Yeah. That's fascinating. You know, when, when you, you get to put in so much work, you start from scratch and then it pays off. Uh, I think in research, the one thing that we don't know is when will it pay off? <laughs> is it, and that's, that's, that's yeah. Yeah. That you, have, mm-hmm. you have to keep, keep you know going at it I always tell people that in my in my case it was always from dopamine rush to dopamine rush where you have finally something that works and then you it's like walking through the desert for weeks months and then you get another dopamine rush and at the end you have a paper but it's 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 very difficult we have a very difficult field and you have to be as a scientist very passionate very patient and being ready to come back to the board if something doesn't work and start yeah. all over again. Yeah, yeah. It's to be passionate and, and, and to resist and to be patient. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I agree. But that's, you know, that's a feature you have to have as a scientist. Because if you are not, well, first of all, passion is what you need. Otherwise, you can't do research. Mm-hmm. And to be, I mean, to have patience <laughs> until you finally succeed. Because success is nothing that comes when, when you submit your manuscript. There is so much luck and so much lottery and so much, you know, it's out of your control you'll see what happens and often you don't receive um, um, comments as you would have hoped for because maybe your enemies are there or people don't want you to publish what you try to publish and then yeah Yeah. you have to deal with it until you finally have a good end (laughs) yeah yeah no I agree and I always tell when I think about it I always try to tell myself that the only thing I can control is how I react Mm. to events I can't control what happened. I can't control what is going to happen. I can only control how I react to things and what, how I keep myself and my decisions and my feelings in check. And come whatever may, we'll figure it out. Um, yeah. But it's sometimes very hard. Yeah, but you control what you, how you react and you also control what you do. I mean, what yeah. you produce is something that is absolutely under your control. And yeah. what I keep telling myself and also the people is, I mean, do your job as good as you can. If it's good enough, somebody else will decide. But don't regret if you get a no, because you could have done better. I think give your best all the time. I think that's the minimum. If it's good enough, we don't know. Exactly, exactly. And sometimes with, you know, uh, publications and reviewers, it's a hit or miss. You you don't know who's reading your, your paper. I've always thought about, you know, it would be really nice to be able to submit publication papers to for to journals anonymously yeah so that uh whoever's reviewing doesn't know who the authors are yeah (laughs) i know but to see if if how how people would react to it you know or if you would get a different type of of review if that would be the case um tell me a little bit about the gq inhibitor and how did you discover it um I mean, we didn't discover it. I think we had, um, we had, um, I was offered a label free biosensor to analyze GPCR signaling. And to analyze GPCR signaling with a label free sensor would require that we can switch off each individual pathway to know what we are actually looking at. Yeah. And the only tool available at that time was um, YM, YM254890, a GQ inhibitor that you just couldn't get. There was a Japanese company, but I found it and they wouldn't give it, they, they gave it to a few people. I have been begging and begging, I never got it. Mm-hmm. And then I found someone who gave it to me and who was then part of our planned paper. And the paper that we then published to show how to this, how to um, to visualize GPCR signaling along all the four pathways was only possible because we could switch off GQ signaling. Mm-hmm. That otherwise we wouldn't have had a tool. And so it was published in Nature Biotechnology only because of this natural product. And this natural product was inaccessible to us at that time. But then 
um, a colleague here in the institute made a structure search and found a paper that nobody has seen telling me, look, this something looks so similar to what you were using because I was absolutely fond of this uh, YN molecule, the okay. security and the, 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 the other um, structure, structurally similar ligand was um, had a name MH and then some kind of numbers that I don't even remember. So that in the end was FR. Mm -hmm. uh, our GQ inhibitor, and we are often associated with it, but we haven't identified it. It was identified 1988 in Japan. Okay. We just re-identified it and did something with it, because this one you could extract from leaves of a plant that, you know, you could just yeah. buy and dry leaves of a plant, so you isolate the molecule, and then we finally had it in our hands to use it. So it was that experimental data with a structurally close analog made us realize how fantastic data you are you produce with this molecule and then we were searching for something comparable we had it and mm -hmm. this is that when research began because switching off gq is was giving us an immense amount of options of projects and this is how it all started no wow yeah. That's fascinating because that it's it's such a great little it's a, it's a good tool that allows you then to to use it and it's important in the field in general to have the correct compounds and the correct tool compounds actually to be able I mean, to yeah 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 and I mean for us it was also so important because I was interested in at that time G protein independent signaling and I was always surprised how can people claim G protein independent signaling if the only tool we have is pertussis toxin that we, yeah. nobody has ever switched off all G proteins yeah. and then you know it was just the next step take away two G proteins downstream of a receptor and then you're still lacking GS and G1213 that we can't yet inhibit with anything decent um, um, probably. So it was also, so, you know, as I said, I'm interested in G GPCR signaling and I'm interested in G protein um, inhibitors because they can take away a transducer of a receptor. So that allows me to see if there is any kind of signaling in the absence of active G proteins. And that was, and I think that our papers on FR and all the, I mean, the, I, I think we, or I have to say different, we, I think we really revived the, the, the G protein branch of the signal construction field by bringing FR to the field and by focusing again on G proteins because we were able to take them away. So you take them away and then you see what else is left, you know, and then you discover uh, there is no signal left. So what is G protein in this independent signaling? And you know, yeah. you go and things get interesting. No, yeah. I think so too. And and you know, I remember you know trying to do um to CRISPR out or to knock out selective G proteins in hex cells, and then hex cells actually, since you you had other G proteins, then they would couple to the other receptor because the cells would adapt. So having a chemical tool that allows you to really inhibit the interaction is a really a, you know, great tool and an additional uh, setting yeah. in the toolbox. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, the, the pharmacological inhibitors like pertussis toxin and FR or YM in combination with the tools developed initially by Asuka Inoue in Japan, yeah. Yeah. you know, all the knockout cell lines were you crisper away beta, uh, the, the arrestins or all G alpha proteins. These were incredible to also reinspect, you know, like paradigms in the field, like G protein signaling, arrestin signaling, because if you, if the G proteins are gone, you have to see arrestin signaling. If if it's a standalone pathway and that was like a big discovery oh there is no arrest in signaling and what we thought was arrest in signaling is actually g protein dependent erg activation so the prime readout considered as arrest in signaling is g protein initiated and these are like wow you know we only know because of the tools but retrospectively i think created in the absence of any tool because we only had pertussis toxin. Yeah. So it's amazing how a field develops in the absence of data to support the hypothesis. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. No, agreed, agreed. Um, <clears throat> having, I know we're, we're uh, winding down a little bit, having worked in industry on GPCRs, worked in academia on GPCRs, I always ask this question. Um, I know the answer to it, 100% yes, uh, but I'd love, like you if you could elaborate on it. Uh, do you think GPCRs are, are still good drug targets? Yes, I think they are. And we have to change the way we consider how they function. 
I think we have been not really successful in the last two decades because we are trying to make drugs that have wanted effects and no side effects with the idea of separating signaling through one pathway, which is causing a good or a bad thing, and signaling through the second pathway, which is causing the opposite. I think this thinking contributes to having no drugs. You know, all this biased signaling, big thing which is there, I think this is the reason for failure, and we have to get away from it to um, to to remembering that the initial GPCR drugs were not found by knowing the target and by dissecting the mm-hmm. pathway and by thinking about wanted and unwanted effects. So, you know, these drugs were put in animals and you see a reaction that is yeah. interesting. So the, 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 the approach is completely different. And I think that GPCRs are still good targets because they are sitting in the membrane and they are good to reach. But I think the way we are trying to address them has to change. And yeah. Yeah, this wanted pathway, unwanted pathway, side effect, wanted effect separation, I think this is all thoughts that won't help us, that just explain why we have no medicine. And if we, we forget this, we'll, we'll get drugs again. <laughs> yeah, well, pro- possibly, because I think I think they're, they function, so I think GPCR's fu- our function is so complex. And when we study them, typically it's one GPCR, two, three pathways, and then... That's that, but they are expressed in cells that express other GPCRs that are part of an organ, that are part of an organism. So it's very difficult to say pathway one versus pathway two. I think we need a way to, yes, under, you have to quote unquote simplify it, but at the same time, you have to keep in mind that whatever drug you're developing is going to end up in a human being and humans mm. are complex organisms. And if we could refine or you know, take a more holistic view as to what does that GPCR in the context of an endogenous system where there's other signals to be uh, to be taken into account that might help us get better drugs faster. But I agree. I think it's very difficult to say yes or no when I'm, I just think about what a GPCR has to do in in the context of a cell endogenously in an organ in an organism. It's hard. To say, oh, it's activating this G protein versus that mm-hmm. G protein versus mm-hmm. that. It's mm-hmm. a it's a holistic reaction yeah. to the environment. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, I I think it's 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 not the right way to think about pathway one here and pathway two somewhere else. I think um my my um, impression is that the GPCRs that control major organ functions like you know like maybe blood pressure heart rate whatever you know they have already been found so now oh. and and they you know angiotensin receptors beta receptors you know there are drugs there blockbuster drugs and you know yeah. so it's like the, the relevance they have is so i mean so obvious and yeah. their the, the, the utility as a drug target is so obvious that and, and these obvious ones have been used now there are some others the, the function of which is much more subtle. And maybe they play a role only under certain pathological conditions, or do you know there it's much more difficult to bring their relevance about, and equally difficult will it be to find a medicine and the type of people that may benefit from this medicine, because yeah. you know, I think the big uh, um how you say, um Ah, probably you know what I mean. It's like a, a small screw that you turn slight, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. The the um, I know what you mean. <laughs> I'm having trouble with words as well. Uh, anyway. you, you mean the the. Um, oh God, I forgot the word as well. But I know what you mean. Yeah. Okay. So it's like yeah. I mean, to 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 lower blood pressure, we know what to do. But maybe for a very specific, I don't know. I don't even have an example now. You know, we we wouldn't know which receptor perhaps plays a role, and then the the, the amount of people that could take this medicine would also be much much lower yeah. than the, yeah. the huge group of people which suffer from high blood pressure, something like this. Yeah, you know? I and think. I, I think. Yeah, please. Yeah. No. No. Sorry. You. No, I, I was just gonna say that. Yes, I think. I think there is a couple of a couple of things. We we know the. We know a large number of GPCRs that are implicated in the most, or the most, re- not necessarily the most relevant, of, in very relevant diseases. And yeah. those are either are being targeted or have we have tried to target them. I think we need more tools to uncover 
the less obvious GPCRs. We need tool compounds. We need systems to figure out. I think I'm fascinated by adhesion GPCRs, as you also mentioned them, but also by orphan GPCRs. I mean, we don't, some of these, we don't know what they do. We don't know where they're expressed. We don't have the tools to detect them. We don't have the tools to study them from a function from from a function perspective. And and then the the other thing that it's a topic uh, that Madan Babu really uh, is great at at um, pre he presented at the GRC as well. It's it's the variance. It's genetic variance in in the po human population. So you might have the same receptor, but you have a different mutant, or you have a different genetic variant. So the drug, the one drug might act differently on two people who have might have the same disease, but the GPCR context changes. Mm. And I think that's also very important to take into consideration. Yeah, yeah, it is. But I'm not sure if this explains why fewer are. Uh, what is this? I don't know. I think I have to maybe unplug my phone now. No worries. Take your time. Much? I don't know. No, now it's gone. Now it's there. Okay. <laughs> So where were we? Sorry. <laughs> so we were we were talking about about the, the the fact that there is less drugs coming out against DPCRs than there were before. Um. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah. Be because okay. of our focus, because of our focus on you know bias signaling, for example, and pathway one versus pathway two. And in the past, people were not not necessarily didn't know that they didn't necessarily know the target. They went and and saw an effect, did the animal studies, and then walked the uh, mm. you know did the studies. Yeah. And and the idea was that we were focusing on on getting a drug through the process. Yes, it would have side effects, but then it would have acceptable side effects. Yeah, but what you also said was the genetic variants and the yeah. genetic variants. So, yes, 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 but, but there are genetic variants, but I don't think that the knowledge of genetic variants will make us have more GPCR drugs. I think there are just so many new aspects to yeah. um, to influencing GPCRs with medicines that it's getting more complex and complicated. Yeah, um, yeah but I, I still think that um, the the two reasons why there are not more drugs is that because the receptors which have like major function on homeostasis are just exhausted, mm -hmm. and we are getting too specific with our wishes, you know, and making yeah. them the drugs so special to be suitable only for very few people, and that means we have to identify these okay. people, and that yeah. perhaps we don't manage. So, but this is, I mean, the whole, um, the whole field of, 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 of medical treatments is getting more and more specific. So it's yeah. not only more different, difficult to find new GPCR drugs, it's more difficult to find new drugs at all because we have so many all, already. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. When, when I was talking about genetic variants, I was more thinking about having a drug and then knowing the genetic background of, of, of patients would determine whether the drug would be given or not, because we know that if it's how much it's going to act, yeah. you know, but if you're sick, you just want something to work. Even if it works just a little bit, you want to get better. Uh, yeah. At the... yeah. Yeah. But uh, you know, if you, uh, let's say you have high blood pressure, you're sick. Well, then there may be beta blockers. There may be angiotensin receptor blockers and yeah. diuretics. So there are so many different things. Yes. And I think there already we have to consider that different patients have a different type of disease. Well, yeah. And on top of that, we have to then, depending on the target, consider the mutations. So it's just yeah. getting more and more difficult. And we perhaps understand more and more why certain drugs only work in one but not the other patient. And that we should, should be taken into account in the future when choosing the medicine you know to give it to the right people yeah. yeah 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 but i mean i would also like to see the pipeline of gpcrs be filled again because we are educating people in our labs that have gpcr expertise so it would be nice to know if they go to industry you know they are needed yeah. Because yeah, no, absolutely. GPCRs are in the pipeline. And when I came to Aventis at that time in, in the year 2000 or 1999, the pipeline was full of GPCRs and they have all disappeared. Mm -hmm. You know, they have, they are all gone. They are completely fed up. They don't want any more. One drug after the other failed. And then yeah. at some point they are gone. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think we we've come a long way when it comes to the tools and the understanding, and it's now 
an era where you need computational biology, you need machine learning in order to make sense of all of the data that we can acquire. I'm thinking here, you know, doing cyclic EMP assays with, with radioactivity and then purifying your cyclic EMP, running it through columns and quantifying your radioactivity versus doing it in, in you know, 1536 well plates and getting a ton of data. And sometimes you can get lost in that data. Yeah. All right, so let's talk a little bit. We, we've talked throughout our conversation about, you know, giving some sort of advice to junior scientists who want to contribute to the field. Um, we talked about, you know, going away, going abroad, showing that you can adjust, you can grow, you can, you know, form collaborations in a different country, in a different lab. Any other advice for junior scientists that you think might be useful? Hmm. That's difficult. I think they should follow their heart and what they are really interested in. I think because it, you have to be good and you have to compete. You will only be good if you do what you like. So make sure you do what you like. Don't go to a lab that publishes well, but doesn't work on something you are really excited about. So that is an advice I have, you know, just mm -hmm. do what you like, because if you do what you like, you will be good at it. I that think so too. Thing. I yeah. think so too, and and you would you wouldn't feel like you're working. It's not like uh, you know doing. You mentioned working in a pharmacy for two years and being bored out of your mind, and it was obviously not a good place for you to be. And I think being able to recognize that you actually don't like something is also very very valuable. But you know what is good? If you work on something you don't like, you are not in danger of working so much that you are actually destroying <laughs> yourself because of the amount of work hours you're putting in so yes. that at least is the positive thing and then you have to, to choose because if you like something you're also automatically motivated to work more yes yes yeah and yes, that's I, the attention yeah i think so too and, and i tend to get emotionally involved with the projects i work on because i like them so much and i have to remind myself that you know my value or or my, my me as a person is not determined as well, how the project turns out. It, I have to think about drawing that line. But then when you like it so much, it's your baby, you know, working on a project and then working, writing up the paper and, you know, responding I, to reviewers. Mm, but this is normal. It's just normal. I don't think you can change it. And if you are different, you are then not like a real scientist. I think yeah. it's your project. It is just as it is, you know, yeah. and then your baby grows and it's fine and it doesn't need diapers anymore. You put it away and you take the next baby. I think that's yeah. absolutely normal because yeah. you, you have to be passionate about your project. You do. I mean, do. so I, I don't think you can change this, no? Yeah, I, th I think that's a normal, that's the normal way of going about it. That's, that's how if you're passionate about something, it's part of you, it's you're always constantly thinking about it, even when you're not in the lab working on it. There are parts of your brain that are focused on solving a problem that you're really passionate about. Yeah, so to be passionate is something I would recommend junior scientists to be and the other thing I recommend is that they should read papers and not only title or abstracts and not believe what people are writing, but be critical, you know, yeah. look at the figures and try to draw their own conclusions. So because often I see and I, I'm doing the same and I guess everybody does the same because there is no time you read titles and you think you know what is in the paper, you read the abstract, you think you know what is in the paper. Well, no, maybe what is in the abstract is the opposite of what you would think is in the paper. And this is why I would say to people, well, read your research careful and make up your own mind and dare to have another opinion than others. And hopefully um, have your other opinion accepted by others with whom you discuss. So that I also think is something important, you know, not just, you, just yeah, scan abstracts, scan titles and accept what there is, well, no. Even if it's from big labs, it may not be what, you know, you would interpret into it or perhaps others. So to be more circumspect about the conclusions you draw based on certain yeah. based on certain data, this is also something I would recommend people to do as long as they have time. Agreed, agreed. Yeah. I think looking at the figures is very important to understand exactly you know, you read the title, you read the abstract, but take a look at the figures and to understand what was done. Do they have the right controls? Do you agree with their conclusions? Uh, 
then again, it's hard because at least when you work in the lab, you're drawn to doing experiments rather than reading. <laughs> Although reading is very important, just as important as doing experiments. All right, last question. And I kind of flipped it a little bit. Uh, top three aha moments that you had as a scientist that shaped your trajectory. Oh. I saw this question before and I thought, well, well I don't actually know because I, I, I don't really know. I mean, aha moment sounds like a big discovery and I'm not sure if any of the discoveries we have made are so big that an aha moment would mm -hmm. follow. I think I was surprised about results, you know, when I, I, I mean, I wanted to see arrestant signaling. So I have to get rid of the G protein to finally see the arrestant signaling. And there is nothing. I only see G protein signaling. It's like an aha moment. I'm not sure if it's big enough to, you know, so it's like I'm, there, there were findings that you um, obtain and you are surprised about the outcome. But I think an aha moment sounds like something Nobel Prize yeah, <laughs> I, I I don't have that, so I have been surprised often. Like um, the discovery that I think uh, residents don't signal, but rather contribute to G protein signaling. That was one of the big discoveries I think that we made, and mm -hmm. and of course it's of relevance for the ligand bias paradigm. But otherwise, I think so. You have many surprises, but um, oh, maybe I should say different. I, I think I don't have really aha moments because the research is not heavy and relevant enough. But what I discover through my scientific career is that the really cool projects are not the ones that I have thought about. These were accidents that you have to spot and then convert into projects because the projects you have to think about are rather boring and the aha moments are the surprises that are actually the opposite of what you thought. And yeah. You know, so and this is then again an advice for young people: be open to interpreting your results different. So don't be biased and look what you are looking for, but be open that something is perhaps completely different, and then discover it and 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 deal with it. Yeah, yeah. Some I think I think that's very relevant. I think it's about you know following where the data goes, uh, mm -hmm. following the science, and you never know where that takes you. You you need to you know think of a project, write up a project, start working on it. But then you'd be surprised where the data will take you and you have to follow it. Uh, and no matter what the data, even if it's opposite, if the results are opposite to your own, um, you know, thinking, you have to make sure that you obviously collected the right data, have the right controls. It is true what you're seeing, um, but also you have to follow it. Yeah, because the aha moments you have when you don't expect what you get and you have not, you know, you, exactly. you couldn't predict this before. Yeah, but I think they are still too small to be, you know, presented yes. here because it's just yeah. always the surprises that happen all yeah. the time. Yeah. These are yeah. all aha moments you have actually all the time because you have a question, you do an experiment and you have 10 new questions and there are 10 little aha moments in there that no, mm -hmm. it's different. And it's just yeah. open to accepting that everything may be different. Yeah. No, agreed. Agreed. And on this note, Evie, thank you so much. We're going to stop recording in a second. Do not go anywhere. We're going to let people wonder what we talk about after we stop recording. But I really, really enjoyed the, the conversation. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having had the opportunity to be here today. And I look forward to some more minutes before I have to rush to my other appointment. <laughs> yes, I will let you go very quickly. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us and listening to this Dr. GPCR podcast episode. We would like to thank our Dr. GPCR podcast guest and our team members, Attila, Ines, Montserrat, Ivana, Andreina, Valint, and Julia. Please mark your calendars for our upcoming 2023 Dr. GPCR symposia. Don't forget to visit us and check out the program. A huge thank you to our ecosystem partners for their support, Domain Therapeutics, GPCR Therapeutics, Design Pharmaceuticals, Montana Molecular, and Orion Biotechnology. You can connect with our partners directly in the ecosystem. Join us today. Also, please subscribe to the Dr. GPCR newsletter. Find us on YouTube. And if you like our podcast, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcast. You can also leave us a testimonial at drgpcr.com slash testimonials. Another great way to support us is to share your favorite Dr. GPCR program with your network and colleagues. With any questions, or suggestions, please email us at hello at drgpcr.com. Until next time, stay safe.